All right, I'm nearly done. Uh, I already mentioned in the findings that the many public water systems are not uh, keeping their uh, emergency response preparedness and response plans up to date. Um, so we're recommending legislation. Um, well, first, we're recommending source reliability studies. So, of course, when there is an incident, there may be a source, and it could be the only source for a public water system that is impacted. And so part of emergency preparedness is identifying alternate sources when um, an when incident occurs. So we're um, recommending legislation to require these types of source reliability studies uh, in the event of an incident. We also want to explore the best way of notifying public water systems of an emergency in alignment with their emergency response plans and as part of their sanitary survey requiring that all public water systems update their emergency response plan on a regular basis, at least every five years. And then the last two are around um, encouraging public water systems to continue to train their staff on emergency response. Again, I already mentioned that they are considered first responders in an event of emergency and um, they need to be trained as such. And finally, encourage all public water systems uh, to become a member of CalWARN or some other uh, network of uh, warning system and um, assistance uh, agreements, I'll say, uh, in the event of, a, of an emergency. And I'll give the Napa earthquake as one example. The city of Napa was not part of the Bay Area network of systems when the incident happened, but they worked quickly to get an agreement together so that other Bay Area water systems were able to deploy some of their uh, staff to help with uh, fixing some of the infrastructure damage that occurred during the earthquake. All right, so that's the end of the recommendations. I have just a couple more slides to round out. I wanted to give you an update on the timeline for uh, issuing the final, the final, final of the plan. We're, we held workshops across the state starting at the beginning of November. Uh, this is the sixth one. Um, we were everywhere from Reading to Salinas to Fresno to Coachella just on Monday. And um, I'm missing one. Oh yes, Los Angeles. Um, and we have currently open a public comment period that ends on December 15th. And so you can provide formal comments in writing to us and I'll show you the link that uh, gives the instructions on how to provide that input to us. Um, and then we'll be considering that input and figuring out the, the um, necessary changes to the plan and possibly additional recommendations that we want to include. We'll be holding a series of board briefings and issue the final plan by the deadline in June of 2015. Now I just want to make it clear that the plan is not a rulemaking. There will not be a board hearing that adopts the plan. The board will not bless the plan. They will receive the plan just like the legislature will. So I just want to make it clear this is not a, a a public, it's not a rulemaking process, and the board will not adopt the plan. Um, what else did I want to say here? I guess that's it. I did want to mention uh, that this is the sixth, the sixth workshop that we've had, and wanted to just give a, a, a general overview of the comments that we've received so far before I open it up for comments from um, participants and stakeholders. So one of the major comments we heard is um, somewhat of a lack of um, analysis of our local primacy agency program and uh, the need for local primacy agencies to provide technical assistance on the ground to the public water systems that they uh, serve. And for those, of the, for those of you who may not know, local primacy agencies are counties that are delegated by us to implement the Safe Drinking Water Act for systems that are under 
200 service connections. Uh, there was some general concern about the recommendations to encourage or even mandate consolidation and that consolidation is not necessarily a one-size-fits-all answer to some of the problems identified in the plan. There was some general support for exploring options for point of use and point of entry devices for treating some contaminants of concern in certain areas where possibly consolidation is not an option, for example. Um, there was some desire to be able to weigh in on the plan uh, before it is finalized. So everyone has seen the, this draft. Um, they'd like to be able to have the opportunity to weigh in on um, the revised version based on comments. Um, there was some concern expressed regarding uh, the recommendation for a water use fee to provide operations and maintenance for some of these systems. Uh, there was another comment in general about now that you're over at the water boards, are you guys going to do a better job of coordinating your permitting across your programs? Uh, there was general concern about the cost associated with metering and whether the cost was really um, commensurate with the benefit of metering. And finally, many small systems that were at our workshops really expressed the need for assistance and help and um, all of the, uh, many of the recommendations we have in the plan, they were very supportive of, of that. So those are some of the general comments. I'm sure we'll hear many of the same flavor today or um, additional ones today. Um, with that, I would like to open it up now for comments from you all and I think the way we'll do that is use the roving microphone. And we'll, st yeah, we'll start with the ones on the cards. Okay, again, my name is Adan Ortega. I'm executive director of the California Association of Mutual Water Companies. We really want to praise the staff for their diligent work. We've been following these workshops across the state, and uh, they've been very accommodating and pleasant to work with, so thank you. Um, I wanted to observe that uh, we're glad to see that Chapter 3 addresses the elephant in the, in the room, which is the regulatory environment for safe drinking water. However, we're somewhat concerned that the Chapter 10 recommendations are not set up to address new and more stringent water quality standards as they evolve. Um, every new standard uh, has been expanding the pool of disadvantaged systems in California in recent years. We're not arguing that uh, there should be less stringent standards, but this plan should lay out a framework to arrest the disadvantages the regulatory system creates for small systems and poor people. It doesn't stop with hexavalent chromium. We've got perchlorate and other standards that are coming next. So we would like to propose a state regulatory strategic plan for safe drinking water that expands a little on what you're doing. The plan would develop what we call a multi-contaminant approach, which is akin to the multi-species approach that they're using for endangered species. We know it's apples and oranges, but, but it's a recommendation we'd like you to consider. While we support exploration of point-of-use devices for small systems, we can't ignore that we are discussing their feasibility because the regulatory system for safe drinking water has created safe drinking water orphans in California that is incompatible with the human right to water. This may be the only recourse in remote areas, but we should steer clear from accepting world-class drinking water standards with second-class remedies for some Californians. Nowhere is this more evident than with the second elephant in the room, which is the new 10th part per billion st standard for hex chrome. You know, you have a large number of entities, particularly small systems, that are disproportionately impacted with no way of really getting uh, revenues and monies uh, to uh, deal with the new standard. Uh, in fact, uh, I saw one study indicating that the noncompliance for hex chrome will be three times greater than it was for arsenic. On the question of consolidation, we think the, the authors are right to see this as a pathway for helping systems, but we would like to urge you to look at this question from a, a variety of perspectives. You know, in our work with mutual water companies around the state, um, we've observed 
mutual water companies and small systems that are simply neglected, that, that have absent owners, that really need the state's intervention. Then we have self-managed uh, systems that include a new class of disadvantaged persons. Um, and these are elderly people. In many locations, you have elderly uh, members of the board who are also responsible for operating the system. They're having a tough time recruiting new board members uh, who would have to double as operators. Uh, and these tasks, in many instances, are physically difficult to perform for them. And then also, uh, there's well-operated systems in California, mutual water companies and other small systems, uh, that are simply looking to accomplish efficiencies by combining with larger public systems or by combining with smaller uh, systems. But uh, we're glad that you've heard the message that one size does not fit all, and we hope that you'll also consider joint powers authorities as another avenue for looking to combine resources. Um, and then finally, uh, I wanted to observe that um, we need a consistent definition of small systems, uh, and I think you've already been responsive to that suggestion. There are different definitions under DWR. Even here with the State Water Resources Control Board, there's a difference in terms of how you identify small systems with respect to the Clean Water Act, and then now with the, the Safe Drinking Water Division. Uh, finally, we've spent uh, considerable effort updating mutuals, uh, our mutual water company database. We think that what you're doing with, with your database is called for and very strongly support uh, the resources uh, that you need to update your database for safe drinking water uh, purposes. As for transparency, we will be looking for legislative remedies as well. And we hope that we can work with you um, instead of keeping each other guessing of what remedies we're going to be going to legislators uh, with. And so with that, thank you very much for hearing us. Thank you. So um, I apologize. We, we looked through the number of cards that we have, and we're going to try to keep comments to five minutes just based on how much time that we have and the number of uh, com uh, commenters that want to comment. So. I'm not going to stand up. I'm going to sit down because I have papers to shuffle through. Um, thank you again, Karen. Um, your workshops have been informative. Um, I'm just here basically uh, from representation from a mutual water perspective. Um, I run a mutual water company in the unincorporated uh, portion of Los Angeles County, the Altadena area. We service about uh, 3,140 water connections with a, a population of about 9,600. Uh, we have been around uh, since 1886, even before that, that that's when we were incorporated. Uh, we take pride in serving uh, high water quality and um, we look to, uh, again, just emphasize that uh, bigger is not always better. Um, in uh, Rubio Canyon's uh, situation, we've uh, provided service to the city of Pasadena for well over a year during their maintenance and upkeep of a, a treatment facility. So we pride ourselves in being able to help our bigger partner in that. And um, also uh, want to just encourage, uh, as you work through this, uh, in your chapter eight, you reference rates and uh, high rates and substandard water. Um, in a lot of cases, you have to really reach out to small community water systems and help them with that. And we hope that maybe this plan will provide resources and funding to help uh, rate structures uh, be put in place to help uh, public water systems. And um, lastly, I think um, what I, I would like to see uh, and understand a little bit more of is how and to what magnitude you're working with LAFCO. I know that LAFCO's reached out to the California Association of Mutual Water Companies, and um, they struggle themselves with public information and being able to um, do the appropriate outreach. So there needs to be more strength in that area. Thank you. Hello, uh, I'm Jim Stone. I'm the Deputy Public Works Director in San Joaquin County. 
San Joaquin County has uh, 32 community service areas that provide water. And of those 32, 22 of them serve less than 100 customers. We also have mutual water agencies. We have small private water agencies. And I, I think this is a great plan, and I really think we're on the right track with consolidation in a lot of cases. But you, ha you really cannot underestimate the limitations that Prop 218 put on these systems. You can mandate that I charge a metered rate, but Prop 218 says I cannot change the rate if there's a majority protest. I have many systems with less than 50 people. This room is, you know, it, it's, 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 the majority protest is a hard hurdle to get over if you have thousands of customers. If you have 20 or 50 or 100 customers, we have systems that are affluent that refuse to pass a new rate structure because they don't want to be metered. Uh, we have, so y you can legislate it on the one hand, but if Prop 218 prohibits me from changing rates, I can't implement those. And it's the same problem we run into in other cases. And consolidation, also, there are rules under LAFCO if you're going to consolidate CSAs, requires a majority vote of both CSAs. So we, I think we're on the right track. We think that consolidation or countywide CSAs or these types of things are the solution for many of these systems. And we have many of our systems are surrounded by urban areas. Others are contiguous to each other's. We do have some very small disadvantaged rural districts that have water quality problems. So we, we have an example probably of just about every problem that you bring out on this board. And we look forward to working with the board. We'd be happy to work with the board and with anyone else in here because there needs to be some legislative change in order to allow us to do the consolidations that we need. We know Prop 218 is not going to change. That's something we're going to have to live for, live with. So, and we've done the education. We've had public meetings. We bring in consultants. We go out and we talk to people. We do everything we can to try to get them to understand that our costs are reasonable. And in many cases, you have one or two people in the room who are anti-government or anti-tax or for whatever reason, and they go out and get enough people to protest so that you, you vote it down. So the only solution to that type of thing is to consolidate into larger districts or to absorb them. And we, we're going to need some changes to the laws under LAFCO and some of the rules, either that or create some sort of a new agency. I don't know what the answer is, but we would be very happy to work uh, to work with staff and work with the legislature to do that because uh, we, we have some systems that we think that's the only way we're going to be able to solve it. So thanks. Good morning, Karen, uh, board members, uh, members of the public. Uh, really appreciate this opportunity to provide, um, you know, have an informal discussion about um, the draft plan and our review of it so far. Aqua represents 430 public water agencies that collectively are responsible for some 90% of the water that's delivered to f homes, farms, and businesses in the state of California. Um, many of our member agencies are entrusted with the responsibility of providing high quality, reliable, safe drinking water to their customers. And accordingly, this plan is of great interest to both us and many of our member agencies. Um, it's already been alluded to today, but this just so happens to be the week of our big uh, semi-annual conference in San Diego. Um, I wouldn't take the lack of participation by, um, you know, water agency member, our member agencies or other association representatives at this meeting as a, you know, uh, as anything less than, you know, the fact that they're down here or not up here. Um, there's certainly a great a deal of interest um, and, I guess, an acknowledgement of the significance of this plan among our groups. So. Uh, the development of, uh, and release of the draft plan represents an important milestone for, for the program. We recognize that it's been a long time coming and that a lot of effort and thought went into the development of the plan. So we commend staff both on the development of this plan and on the um, process with which you've rolled this out. I think the idea of statewide workshops is really a great model. Um, you know, there's a lot in the report that we were, uh, and, and plan that we um, support. But given limited time, I see I'm down to three and a half minutes here, I'll uh, really focus on two areas of concern. Um, the first relates to the mandate for annexation of small water systems that were, are within the sphere of influence of a large water system. Um, as acknowledged in the draft plan, among regulated water systems, problems related to consistent compliance with drinking water standards are concentrated among small systems serving less than 200 connections. Um, an essential point that was captured in both the 2012 and 2013 reports of the Governor's drink Drinking Water Stakeholder Group is that um, the best solution for each community facing challenges will differ among options that are not limited to shared solutions like consolidation. 
Um, the consolidation of small water systems with compliance problems with larger systems can be a solution that would work. However, we're really concerned that the mandate for annexation included in the draft plan is simply too broad and cr would create new problems for water systems. Um, first of all, as has been alluded to, by its terms, it wouldn't only apply to water systems that are facing compliance challenges or small systems that are, um, have water quality problems. It would apply to all systems statewide. Um, more significantly, however, we're really concerned that the mandate would not address the barriers that currently prevent some consolidations. And there are legal, technical, and financial barriers that currently prevent many consolidations. First, liability is a major challenge and dis disincentive facing water districts with respect to, cons to consolidation. Water agencies need clear liability protection when annexing with existing water systems. Um, the legislature has recently acknowledged this issue and addressed it in a limited way. Um, earlier this year, Governor Brown signed SB 1130 with legislation which was specifically designed to allow public water agencies in Riverside County to provide necessary assistance to dis a disadvantaged water system that was facing um, uh, compliance challenges um, without being held liable for uh, failing in, uh, for past administrative actions or operational deficiencies of the small system. Aqua supported SB 1130 and we think it's an example of a tailored solution to one of the actual barriers with consolidation that provides some promise. Uh, second of all, mandated annexation would present significant financial challenges. Mr. Stone touched on Proposition 218 as a potential obstacle. Um, debt liability is also another issue associated with consolidation that is of potential significance. Finally, on technical barriers to consolidation, the draft plan in other areas acknowledges that technical feasibility is a consideration that needs to be taken into account. Uh, we just think that, um, you know, that should be reflected in, in this section as well. Um, we support the development and implementation of adaptable approaches that can solve specific problems of communities that lack access to safe drinking water. Voluntary consolidation is certainly one tool that can be appropriate, and recent legislation uh, demonstrates that a tailored approach to consolidation can be successful. Uh, we would urge staff to delete the mandate for annexation in the, in the draft plan and replace it with a proposal to develop a strategy that would really address the barriers of consolidation that I outlined. Finally, moving on very briefly to the uh, water usage fee, which is included in the draft report. Um, we recognize the need for the development of a stable long-term funding source. Um, you know, in the work that Aqua had and with stakeholder, did with stakeholders on Proposition 1, we think that was manifest. Um, you know, as you, you said, Proposition 1 includes 260 for safe drinking water solutions with an emphasis on providing those to disadvantaged communities. We recognize that O&M challenges present unique challenges. Um, but we'd really encourage uh, the Water Board to engage stakeholders in continued discussions to identify viable um, safe drinking water solutions. We think the water usage fee is a tax under Proposition 26. It would require two-thirds vote of the legislature to enact, um, and that's a significant hurdle to overcome. Um, on both of these major issues, we really look forward to continuing to work with stakeholders. Uh, we will be providing detailed written comments, and uh, we um, hope to have suggested language on each of these points. But really, um, we look forward to engaging both the Board and stakeholders on uh, dealing with these um, significant issues. So again, we thank board for all the board and board staff for all of their efforts related to the development of the plan, and my time is up, so I will stop there. Uh, thanks so much. I'm Phoebe Seaton. I'm with Leadership Council for Justice and Accountability. And as a, I guess as a um, slight disclaimer, we um, are counsel on the case uh, with respect to the drinking water plan and have been working with the department uh, over the last two years uh, monitoring plan development. Um, very, very pleased to see the plan and very pleased that it has come to the public for, for um, comments and the workshop um, system throughout the state as well. Um, and we're generally, I think, kind of echo the support of disadvantaged communities throughout the state that you've heard, um, very supportive of uh, looking for uh, resources to support um, drinking water quality and access in, in uh, lower income communities and around among lower income populations. Um, and a lot of the strategies outlined to identify some of those resources. Um, we actually, you know, might have a different concern on the uh, mandating annexation. 
um, without some, would like to see definitely some safeguards in place for those communities to be annexed. Um, what we do see a lot of is um, uh, unfair rate structures and representation structures um, for communities subject to annexation. So we would want to see some um, safeguards in place. Um, probably not surprisingly, very, very supportive of all uh, recommendations related to consolidation. And what we look forward to doing is working um, on the transition and actually in, and seeing the board take a more uh, proactive role in consolidation in LAFCOs um, at the local level, still seeing a lot of recalcitrance um, in terms of shared solutions. Um, also, we do, we're supportive of metering. We really do need to see resources in place to make sure that lower income communities have the resources to install and maintain um, those meters. And, um, and we are, um, I think the, the one thing that we, we think is missing from the plan, kind of major area, is um, source protection. Um, that I think there's an acknowledgement that, uh, that, that contamination is impacting drinking water sources, but um, n um, not sufficient kind of uh, resources or attention to how to um, address um, those, those pollution sources. And um, uh, I think that the, the another, another thing that, that would generally, our general comments are the recommendations are very strong in terms of transparency, consolidation, um, addressing the lack of resources, and just making sure that a lot of the objectives are, um, are implemented and working with the, um, with the division to make sure that happens. Um, would like to see, again, more transparency with related to Kind of water quality throughout the state, and um, and are very hopeful. And again, um, I, w we will provide some written comments, but in again, in general, are very supportive of these recommendations. Uh, Danny Merkley. Uh, California Farm Bureau Federation. Um, in five minutes or less, I will give a very quick flyover of what we will submit in more detail uh, in writing before the 15th. Um, to begin with, um, um, we agree that um, there are a very wide range of issues and therefore a wide range of solutions. Um, things like point of use are very appropriate in some locations, some places. Uh, particularly for some short-term fixes. Uh, consolidations are very good, but again, that needs to be handled uh, very carefully and without getting into the weeds. Uh, uh, many of us have been talking about that over the last couple of years in different forums and, um, and looking at that and some of the protections and some of the impediments to, to helping those move along. Um, there's also a, obviously a very broad range of uh, contaminants, therefore there's, uh, there should be a very broad-based funding source uh, looking at, at everything from um, uh, chrome-6 to naturally occurring arsenic to uh, nitrate issues. Uh, for example, on the nitrates, uh, they come from a variety of sources. Um, and in most, if not all cases, they're not from nefarious acts. They're from, uh, in, in the case of agriculture, applying uh, uh, fertilizers at the recommended rates, oftentimes recommended by some of the same universities that have done the studies um, in, in recent years on, uh, on the issue. And we're learning more about that, and we do need to act. But the time it to act is now. This is very serious, particularly for the economically disadvantaged communities. Um, a new funding program is going to take time to ramp up. It's going to be uh, uh, encumbered with certain amount of administrative overhead and, and time to get that in place. Uh, that is why um, we had advocated so strongly for um, dollars in the bond that was just passed last month. Uh, that can get out the door quicker, and it is our expectation and hope that uh, the Water Board will be able to get those dollars out and moving more quickly than others have been able to do in the past. Um, there's $520 million in the bond for this, and that's very important. Uh, when it comes to Prop 218, 
Um, we've heard those concerns over and over again, and we do understand those. Um, but it is also important that we make sure that we've got protections in place uh, to keep fees or additional fees uh, somewhat in check so that the public has an opportunity to understand what they're voting for and why. Um, people can't pass their DMV uh, driver's license. I wouldn't want the Department of Motor Vehicles then to lower the standards for those tests, especially after what I just saw coming back from Glen County in the rain today. <laughs> so um, we have some serious concerns about weakening uh, the process um, uh, with Prop 218. And with that, I'll end. Thank you. Hi, I'm Andrea Ventura with Clean Water Action. Um, I just want to make two general comments with the idea that we'll obviously put more detail into our written comments. Um, the first is, has to do with the setting of MCLs. Uh, you know, we, we obviously are very glad to hear a lot of discussion and coverage in this report on getting funding to small disadvantaged communities because really that has been what we think something that has skewed the setting of MCLs over the last few years. Uh, we feel that while we recognize the need to talk about health as well as f technical feasibility and economic feasibility, uh, the discussions on setting specific MCLs has been very skewed toward the money end of it, and, and specifically the cost of treatment, which means that we're not always setting, in our opinion, the most optimal health protective drinking water standards. And what we would really like to see is a commitment where we bring that more into balance and we do put an emphasis on setting the most stringent uh, MCLs as we can on drinking water standards. However, we recognize the very real need to make sure then that all communities in California can meet those standards. And so the emphasis needs to be put on finding the funding systems and bringing them into place so that low-income, uh, low disadvantaged communities that do not have the proper infrastructure or the capacity to maintain those, those systems are able to do so. Without bringing that balance into play here, we feel that we will continue to perpetuate uh, environmental injustice where people are not optimally protected because they can't afford it. And so that, I think that emphasis on and that discussion in this report and this, uh, these recommendations are very, very important. And we want to work, we certainly support things like looking at uh, groups of contaminants, at cumulative impacts, and trying to be more efficient in, in the ways that we address those. And we want to work with the small communities uh, in order to make sure that they are able to meet those standards. The other thing I just wanted to mention very briefly is we would like to see more emphasis, particularly when we're talking about things like emerging contaminants, on source reduction before it becomes a problem that we have to try to treat our way out of. Uh, and, and, you know, there, this is important not only for our current water systems and, and co co current contaminants that we're dealing with and sources of water, but also the new sources of water that we're going to have to look at in the future, for instance, recycled water, you know, in direct potable reuse. Uh, we're going to have to contend with the pharmaceuticals and the non-regulated pesticides and the endocrine disruptors that are coming out of personal care products that are ending up in our water systems. And one of the things that we would like to see, for instance, is just one recommendation, is having the boards consider taking more, uh, asking for more authority to regulate those sources. The Air Board can actually regulate the use of specific products when they find that they are causing products, uh, problems in certain uh, air regions. We need to be doing the same thing at the Water Board level. Uh, there is a big movement. We have the Safer Consumer Products Regulations, a big movement in the state to move away from these kinds of products. But we, we need the authority at the water level to, to start looking at source control. That's just one recommendation, but we need to look more at stopping the pollution from getting into our water systems beforehand. We'd like to see more discussion of that in the recommendations and, and the analysis in this report. So those are all the cards that we have. So 
If anyone that wanted to speak and did not submit a card and would like to speak, let us know now. Good morning. Please introduce yourself. Noe Paramo, California Rural Legal Assistance Foundation. So thank you for this workshop and the draft plan. And just a quick comment as it relates to metering and affordability. So I like the concept around how to provide uh, affordable access to clean drinking water. But as it relates to metering and what the affordability will be, so we like to look at it from an equitable perspective, understanding that farm worker communities need water in the fields, clean drinking water that's required. So there'll be that use. And then the other part is when a farm worker gets contaminated with pesticide use, we encourage that they w wash separately. So there'll be additional use of water. So those factors taken into consideration when it costs to affordability. Thank you. Hi, thanks. Brian Lawrence and Larry Walker Associates. Um, so just uh, playing on the source watershed protection uh, comments um, and my earlier clarif clarification question, um, I think it would be beneficial, and especially with the strengths of the water boards and surface water and uh, surface water protection, uh, to look a little bit more into that in Chapter 3, I think, that we were talking about earlier. Um, especially uh, some of the, uh, to introduce some of the information that's, uh, and research has been done since the 1993 report, um, things like the Central Valley Drinking Water Policy uh, that really looked at uh, sources and uh, management in the watershed. Uh, the other comment, and then I'm done, uh, is on the contaminants of emerging concern. And uh, just a comment to uh, potentially break those down a little bit. It's a broad class of different sources and different types, and sometimes when those are grouped together, it, the conversation gets confusing, and I think there could be more clarity on those that are of concern for drinking water. Thanks. Any more questions? Anyone else? All right, I'll give you a couple more minutes to decide and let you know that this is the link that has all of the information about the plan, including the draft plan, the notice of opportunity to comment, which includes the instructions on how to submit written comments. We've got all the workshops done, so your notices of workshops are not going to be useful to you, but that's there as well. And then that's my contact information, as well as Nick Shudeau's contact information if uh, you want to uh, have any questions outside of uh, the workshop today. And I want to thank you all very much for coming. This is your last chance. If you want to make a comment, raise your hand, or I'm going to close the workshop. For th oh, there's one. The slides are already posted on there, and I, I apologize, I didn't mention that. So yes, it's all there. All right, thank you very much for coming and braving the inclement weather, weather to come and give us your input. I appreciate it.